We already heard it today, several times actually. Physics starts with observation. We observe, and based on this observation, we come up by guessing, yeah, by intuition, if you like, with statements about the world. We then derive, by logic, more statements that should be true, and then we test them by observation, if they are true. If they're not, we take another guess, and so it continues. And what we call our world view is the sum of these statements that we compile about the world. A common world view in the 14th century of Europe regarding the motion of stars against the fixed star horizon was that the stars were attached to the inside of a celestial sphere that is mechanically moved by angels. That was high tech back then. <laughs> now, with our increasing abilities of prediction and observation, of course, our worldview can and will eventually change. Well, at least, so this one is not anymore, be assured, amongst the front runners, at least in Europe. So, let, let, let me give you another example. So as, as Philip already said, so, uh, for, for some reason I'm known here as the guy from Vienna. And, <laughs> and um, my office in Vienna is uh, right next to the old office of Erwin Schrödinger and also right next to the library that manages the, um, uh, the correspondence of Schrödinger. And recently I came across um, uh, the following letter that I'm going to show you in a second that was written by Albert Einstein to Schrödinger um, from the US on August 8th, 1935. So that means uh, last week, 87 years ago. So uh, Don't worry, it's German, but I'm going to translate it to you. Dear Schrödinger, you are in fact the only human with whom I really like to discuss. For almost all the guys do not see the theory from the facts, but only from the theory the facts. They cannot get out of the once assumed concept net, but only fidget around in it neatly. But you look at it as you wish, from the outside and from the inside. Thereby, we are sharpest opposites in our fear of which way to be expected. So the rest of the letter deals with the core issues that still concern us today in modern quantum physics. Namely the question, or let's say our struggle to understand what quantum physics says about the world. The discussion between the two then culminates in the famous thought experiment of Schrodinger's cat. So what is this about? Quantum physics allows experiments whose outcome are actually in contradiction to the assumption that a system is either in one state or in another. Such as, for example, the location of a photon when it hits a glass plate. We call it a beam splitter. This is depicted here. Coming from the left is the photon. It hits the glass plate. And we speak of a quantum superposition in that case. And somewhat loosely, we say that both states are realized simultaneously. So we say the photon takes both paths. But what we actually mean when we say that is that we can conduct an experiment that is in contradiction with the assumption that the photon either goes that way or that way. And because this is a very long sentence, we say the photon takes both paths. Couple this now with, in Schrodinger's own words, a devil machine, a devil's machine, and then you get a state in nature where a cat is dead and alive. Or again, in other words, means there is an experiment, at least in principle, whose outcome contradicts the assumption that the cat is either alive or dead. In this letter that I showed you, Einstein has made his uneasiness about um, this uh, situation very, very clear. He says, and I quote here, 
in the letter, by no art of interpretation can this psi function, so this is the mathematical object that describes the situation, be made an adequate description of the real factual situation. Because, he continues in the letter, because in reality there is no such thing um, as being both dead and alive. Regardless of how bizarre or, again in Schrodinger's words, burlesque uh, the situation may seem to us, modern quantum experiments with single particles show that the predictions of quantum physics are actually correct. So a well-known example I show here, these are the experiments of my colleagues Markus Arndt and Anton Zeilinger in Vienna, who have shown that a molecule, you can see here, this fluorinated uh, carbon buckyball molecule, can behave as if it would take two paths, or both paths, in a double-slit experiment. Or again, the correctly said, the appearance of interference fringes, so this is the outcome of the experiment, um, is inconsistent and in direct contradiction with the assumption that this molecule has gone only one of the two paths. So this experimental evidence that we have in the lab of quantum superpositions of larger and larger objects presents us with really one of the greatest intellectual and philosophical challenges that we have currently still have, namely, how is a consistent, so a non-contradictory worldview possible against the background of states that are allowed by quantum physics? And as I just showed you, it is a fact that these states are part of our experimentally accessible world. We cannot argue them away. So what about gravity? Einstein's general theory of relativity is the most successful theory so far to describe the phenomena of gravitation. We heard that several times today. So the concept of force here is replaced by the motion in a curved space-time. Masses bend the space-time and um, test masses then move in curved space and we perceive this motion in, in, in curved space as a force between these two objects. Even light rays follow the metric of curved space. We have also seen that in various uh, examples today. Historically, this heralded the successful experimental confirmation of Einstein's theory um, of gravity by Eddington and culminated then 100 years later in the truly spectacular image of light deflection by a black hole. No less spectacular, again, you also saw that already, was the groundbreaking experimental confirmation of gravitational waves by the uh, kilometer-long um, laser interferometers of uh, LIGO and Virgo, the uh, so-called laser interferometric gravitational wave observatories, both in the US and in Europe. Now, it turns out, even clocks and quantum systems are not spared the phenomenon of gravity. So, clocks tick differently at different heights of the gravitational field, we already uh, heard that, which must be taken into account in satellite navigation systems, such as GPS, for example. A particularly impressive example um, is an experiment by researchers led by Dave Weinland, um, uh, back then at, um, at NIST in Boulder, who have shown how the frequency of an atomic clock changes you can see it here, the rise in frequency, the yellow line, um, when the experiment is raised just by 30 centimeters. So they just took the whole experimental table and they raised it in the lab by 30 centimeters and could see how the clock changed the ticking. And only a few months ago, um, a team of researchers around Chun Yi, also at NIST in, in Boulder, reported that their clocks are now uh, sensitive, uh, um, I, I don't even dare say it, the, to uh, gravitational effects at the one millimeter level. Uh, so, which means probably in the future when you, when you, when you have your, um, when, you, when you give your time to someone else, right, you should also uh, give your very exact space-time coordinates to make sense of that time. <laughs> so, um, going further, as early as the 1970s, 
Researchers led by Samuel Werner in the experiment that is now famously known as the cow experiment after the initials of the authors, Colela, Overhauser and Werner, they were able to show that Earth's gravitational field can affect the um, wave packet of a quantum system, of a, of a neutron in their case. And today this is used in atomic interferometers to accurately measure acceleration due to gravity. So a particularly intriguing example um, uh, that I show here comes from the lab of my uh, colleague Markasevich from Stanford, who is uh, also here sitting at the, the D-Wave table. So he and his team, they can create superpositions of atoms on a half meter scale. I mean, half a meter. Again, this is just the beginning. Uh, so we have an object that is um, here and here at the same time at both places. Uh, and beyond that, so for, which for example means that you now, um, uh, since you are sensitive to gravity, you can probe the effects of space-time curvature on a single extended quantum system because it's so large while it probes um, the gravitational field. And this is just one of the many examples of experiments that can be done. So all is good, no? General relativity works, quantum theory works. And to this day, there's no single experiment that would contradict the predictions of either of those two theories. So, where's the problem? I'm reformulating what you already heard uh, today. The problem is that both theories rest on different worldviews. And these worldviews are mutually exclusive. This is the actual bummer. Gravitational theory simply does not know what to do with the superposition principle in its present form. And quantum theory cannot live with a space-time that is fixed regardless of the observer. In other words, if quantum theory is correct, truly holds, we must radically rethink our concepts of space, of time, of space and time. If general relativity is correct in its present form, we must radically rethink the role of quantum theory. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is an experimental problem. <laughs> I've waited so long to say that. Huh? <laughs> There's simply no experiment today that answers the question whether gravity requires a quantum description. So, for example, what if we can make, take now a quantum system and make it so heavy that it generates a measurable gravitational field? then we could measure the gravitational field of a quantum object and directly investigate whether the quantum superposition principle applies on the level um, of gravitational fields, taking it further the concepts meaning to space-time. So can space-time be produced in a quantum superposition? Is this something we can think of doing uh, in the lab? This question was already asked several times by famous scientists. One of the first ones was certainly Richard Feynman to ask the question. Uh, Bill Unruh here um, famously asked this question several times. Um, but in all of the cases, without the prospect of an experimental realization. So I quote here. I, I don't know, Bill, if this is now Feynman's words or your words, because I think that uh, you, you, you both have said um, similar things uh, on that. So uh, the, the quote is, one serious difficulty is the lack of experiments. Um, furthermore, we are not going to get any experiments. So we have to take a few points how to deal with problem, uh, problems where no experiments are available. So resorts to the realm of Gedanken experiments and see how far they take us and if they lead to some contradictions. But now we are, um, with regard to, to Feynman's first work, 60 years later, um, we know how such an experiment could actually look like. So um, what we need for this is a quantum superposition of an object that is heavy enough that it creates a, um, a measurable gravitational field. So we need to ask ourselves two questions. First of all, how small can we make a mass 
and still measure its gravitational field. So in other words, um, can we isolate a gravity as a coupling force for smaller and smaller objects? And the second question we have to ask is, how heavy can I make a quantum system without losing coherence? Okay, so without losing the quantum properties of the system. These are the two challenges um, that we are facing. Now, uh, let's start with the first question. The typical masses in gravitational experiments are either astronomical objects or, on Earth, typically kilogram-sized masses. So um, one of my uh, heroes in experimental physics just lives a couple of hours uh, uh, south of here, Eric Edelberger, at the University um, of Washington. This is one of his uh, very famous experiments. So what we wanted to know was, what challenges await us when we get to much smaller objects, let's say a, a millimeter-sized gold sphere. Yeah? So the idea is simple. You take a mass, you shake the mass periodically, and so it generates a gravitational field at the uh, location of the second mass. So the motion of the second mass also starts to oscillate, and this displacement can be measured. Yeah? It's simple in principle. Uh, however, even though the idea is very simple, uh, doing the experiment is not, so, uh, is not so trivial. So after all, gravity is the weakest force in the universe. Yeah? And um, uh, especially, uh, uh, this is uh, very noticeable when you go down in mass and make, the, make it smaller um, and smaller. So to give you an idea of the numbers, our gold sphere that we use, this millimeter gold sphere here that you see, it weighs 90 milligrams. Okay, so, and due to the, the gravitational field, um, it accelerates a second mass that is next to it um, with an acceleration, uh, acceleration that, is a, uh, that is approximately 30, so 30 billion times smaller than um, the gravitational acceleration that Earth exerts on this mass. Um, and in terms of displacement, um, the, the, the expected displacement in this experiment is on the order of a few nanometers. So it means a millionth of a millimeter. Now, um, the, the biggest obstacle in these types of experiments is actually, for us, it was traffic around our lab building. Buses, cars, pedestrians, the gravitational field of a 90-ton Vienna city tram that passes our lab in a 70 meters distance. Before that, I didn't know how, what the weight of a Vienna city tram was, but now, <laughs> now I know. So um, you, you, you see that here um, in, this, um, in this picture, can you, yeah, you can see, um, this is just a time trace of the signal of our, of, of our measurement apparatus. And you see, uh, it's mostly noisy. Yeah? So it's noisy, noisy, and then you see it gets a little bit more sparse, the data down here. Okay, this is during the night. So during the night, it's less noisy, and then you see this, you see these bumps here. Do you see them? So these are these little bumps. This was the night bus. Okay, so the night bus that traveled the street, stopped and went. And you see here, there's a late night bus. So <laughs> basically, uh, we said this is the most um, expensive traffic monitoring system that we could come up with in, in Vienna. Well, so but you can see, best time for measurements was, of course, the night. And um, finally, um, uh, uh, so typically between midnight and 5 a.m., but finally, it was actually um, the Christmas time, the Christmas vacation, where we could complete the measurement and we could measure the gravitational field of um, what is the smallest mass to date in such, uh, such experiments, a one millimeter gold sphere. So this is the mass of a ladybug, approximately. Okay? Um, the, and the accuracy of these measurements really exceeded our wildest expectations. The accuracy uh, corresponded to an acceleration that is 13, this time 1, 3, orders of magnitude um, smaller than the acceleration on the surface of the Earth. Now, what are the next steps? Um, now, at the moment, we prepare an experiment where we reduce the size of the mass even further. Okay, so we want to go down another factor of 10,000 in the size of the, um, uh, uh, of the mass, or in the, in the mass itself, which for the experts means that the next step is to measure a gravitational field of um, a mass of the size of the Planck mass. Uh, this is the experiment that we are planning at the moment. Um, of course, there's no way we can do that anymore in our Vienna uh, uh, inner city laboratory facilities. Uh, so what we are doing right now is 
we minimize environmental influences and we're moving the experiment um, uh, to a mine shaft in the vicinity of Vienna. Now, so we now are, are in a good way to isolate the gravitational field or gravitational coupling of very small masses. So this is the question number one, is essentially uh, ticked. But what about the quantum properties of such masses? Well, um, from atoms up to macromolecules, this I already showed you, we already know that quantum superpositions can be produced. But be aware, this is still 18 orders of magnitude away in mass from our, from our gold sphere. Yeah, there's still a way the, to go. So to achieve sufficiently large masses um, that then generate measurable gravitational fields, um, one needs many, many atoms in a small, as small volume as possible. So essentially you need a solid state object. And um, uh, so more than 15 years ago now, um, my team and I and many others around the world started working on the question, how can we control the motion of solid state systems in the quantum regime using the methods that were available back then, namely the methods of quantum optics, atomic physics, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, from, from these considerations and from these experiments in collaboration with many other colleagues around the world emerged eventually um, a very exciting field that is nowadays um, known as quantum optomechanics. So what's the idea? The basic idea is very, very simple um, and is known from atomic physics already. You, uh, you use radiation pressure, so the fact that if um, you shine light on something, it, it exerts momentum on an object um, uh, of light, so you use the radiation pressure of light um, to manipulate the motion of this object. And if you manage to isolate the photons when they are scattered off that object that carry away the energy of the object, then you can cool the motion down to its so-called quantum ground state of motion, so such that the motion of the, of the object is only governed by the laws um, of quantum physics. So, and this is, uh, by the way, a very well-known principle in atomic physics is the principle of laser cooling. This is uh, sort of the, was the dominant principle that then gave birth to the whole field of atomic physics, Bose-Einstein condensates, and so on, um, and so on. But now it works, it's applied now to solid-state objects that have billions of atoms. Now, um, about 10 years ago then, the, the idea arose that uh, coupling to gravity could be really, really interesting. Um, and uh, so it quickly became clear that these solid state mechanical oscillators that I showed you, these little diving boards, they're they are, they are not the right system um, uh, to go. So our question was, how can we combine the advantage of a solid state system um, with the advantage that the atomic physics guys have, namely that they have very long quantum coherence times um, in their systems over seconds because those, uh, those objects are mostly in free fall. They do not really interact with the environment so strongly. And our answer was, well, uh, just levitate the solid. Uh, and that way you isolate it more strongly from the environment and you can manipulate it uh, better. So um, let me give you two examples. We are currently studying optically levitated glass spheres. So it's li really little, uh, little glass spheres, just under 200 nanometers in size about a factor of 10,000 times smaller um, than the gold spheres, and 10 to the 12 times uh, lighter still, okay? <laughs> so uh, using a microscope, we can measure um, the particle motion with a precision that is governed only by Heisenberg's uncertainty limit. Um, and we can do that in real time. So it means we can measure in real time the quantum trajectory of a room temperature object. And using this information, we can do real-time feedback on it and stabilize it in its quantum ground state of motion. And of, of course, uh, the real world looks different. It's a little bit more complicated here. I give you a glimpse of the lab. Um, you need control theory. You need Kalman filtering. You need people who really know what they're doing in electronics, uh, real-time uh, data feedback, and so on and so on. But uh, what I show you here now um, is a picture of a glass particle Okay, so this is our 200 nanometer glass particle that is in its quantum ground state of motion at room temperature. Okay, um, and so in, 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 the, in the group we typically choke, where you see the image, you, you have, it looks very, very familiar eh, to something you've seen already today. <laughs> yeah? And so uh, the, the, ru the running gag in the group is, you see, um, the only difference between quantum and gravity is the color. So <laughs> quantum is green, the gravity is orange. So. We solved it. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, if you do not want um, or cannot read out so precisely as we do it with the microscope, there are other means. Uh, after all, we know how quantum optics works, and um, uh, what you can do, for example, is just take two mirrors and put the particle between the two mirrors. That's called an optical resonator. And that um, helps now to scatter only those photons along the axis uh, uh, along these, um, uh, the mirrors, which take energy from the glass sphere. And so you can cool the motion down to the quantum ground state. And this is, again, something we, we did recently. But the great challenge now, which is shown here for the coming years, is now to develop methods to transform now this quantum motion into a superposition. This is now the next experimental challenge. And the whole thing with a mass that is heavy enough to find out whether the gravitational field is also subject to the laws of quantum physics. So whether space-time can actually be put in a superposition. So I, I, I conclude on a historic note. 65 years ago, the leaders in the field of gravitational physics met in Chapel Hill uh, at the invitation of uh, Bryce and Cecil de Witt to discuss the future of their field. At the end of the conference, there were two main questions. Do gravitational waves exist? And does gravity require a quantum description? So, the first question could be answered experimentally recently. For the second question, thanks to the newly founded Quantum Gravity Society, again, experts from all over the world meet, this time in Vancouver at the invitation of Philip Stamp and Bill Andrew to discuss the way to go to solve our long-standing quantum gravity dilemma. And now I'm paraphrasing Einstein's letter from the beginning, even though, even though some of us are sharpest opposites in our view of which way to be expected. This is why I very much look forward to what new insights will be delivered by experiments and Gedanken experiments of the next decade. So we are well on our way. I hope I could show you that. Thanks to the breathtaking developments in the control of quantum system, the basis for today's quantum technology, we really uh, built on that. We have left the level of thought experiments. Okay? And now uh, we know what needs to be done to get closer to an answer. We need those to bring these things together. We have gained quantum control over solids, weighing billions of atoms, and we will soon um, be able to bring together these two domains. So it's a fantastic example in my eyes how basic research and technology really go hand in hand um, to create something bigger. So a big thank you to the Quantum Gravity Society for bringing us all together, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.